Good to be back here again. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, uh, I mean, my background, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of things, and I really like to, to try to see how things fit together. And I'm going to take you on a pretty broad brush here. We're going to start with weather forecasting, go all the way through uh, in terms of how that helps you build uh, wind and solar projects, and then how you integrate that into the power system, how that's even impacting market design and even in impacting FERC regulations and NERC rules uh, by the time we're done, because all this stuff really does fit together. Yeah, at, least, at least in my head it does, and I hope I'll convince you that it does as well. Yeah, WindLogix, uh, as Bruce mentioned, was, uh, was really started by a supercomputer folks from, that spun off a of Control Data Corporation. And uh, they got very interested in, in the software running on supercomputers back in the 80s. And a lot of that was large weather forecasting models, because they're very computational. They're a major customer for supercomputers back at that time. Uh, and they were doing a lot of very interesting projects. They were collecting a lot of hour-by-hour -hour weather data that I'll show you. And then they would, it would help people do custom modeling with that. Some of it was for uh, like plume dispersion problems, environmental modeling. Others was custom forecasting systems for uh, the Air Force, things like that. Uh, and then uh, I joined the company in 2000, and they'd, they'd done all these great science projects. They had all these wonderful tools, and uh, I'll show you some visualization technology that we have. But we were looking, you know, how can you actually apply this in other places? And we saw, we saw wind energy really starting to ramp up about 2002. I mean, wind energy had a big, uh, a big time in the 80s with the oil crisis. And then it kind of died down. So those, those early projects you see, like in Southern California around uh, Palm Springs, you know, that was 80s stuff. We don't build projects like that anymore. Uh, but then it started really taking off about 2002, where it became more of a mainstream source of, of power for us. And we looked at how people were actually developing those projects, and we said, you know, they're putting up a, a tower and measuring the wind for a year, and then maybe correlating with an airport, and then they're trying to guess what the next 25 years will do. And they're building these, you know, 100, 200, 300, 500 million dollar projects. You know, isn't there a better way to get the right answer before you do that? And that was really uh, the business plan behind WinLogix. We said, we, we've done all this weather analysis, let's apply it to power projects now. And of course, one thing has led to another. I got involved with a lot of the integration studies. I was, uh, our company helped, and I was personally involved with the, uh, like the 2006 Minnesota integration study. I've done a lot of those now. So that got me into you know, power systems, market design. So I'm not, I'm not actually educated to do any of the stuff I'm talking about today. My degree was actually in biomedical engineering from Wisconsin. Uh, but uh, I like to keep learning and see how it fits together. Today, WinLogix is about uh, 65 people. About half of them have an advanced degree in meteorology. Uh, master's or PhD usually. Uh, and the other half is all of the, uh, the computer science and mathematics to take us to the next step with this. We do a lot of crunching of data that I'll show you, but then you get to a point where a lot of the, a lot of, it ends up being a big data sort of problem because the weather models themselves create data, then you've got all the, the data now coming from the power system. So we're hiring a lot of applied math folks to do that last optimization now as well. We were actually acquired by uh, one of our customers, then called FPL Energy, now called Next Era Energy, uh, and uh, they were just one. And we were doing projects for Minnesota Power back in the, uh, you know, many years ago as well, around 2004, 2005. Uh, but we became a wholly owned subsidiary of Next Era in 2006. And we still run that way. We're still a, a separate brand. We provide services to other people in addition to Next Era, but we do all of their wind and solar projects, and uh, we're also now helping them and other people trade it into markets. And we're even moving beyond that into uh, a, you know, load forecasting, uh, feeder outer prediction based on large data sets, things like this. Uh, really, going forward, we don't even consider ourselves to be a weather company, uh, although we certainly have a lot of, lot of expertise with that. It's really more about you know, how can you optimize the energy system. And weather is always a driver of our power system, right? So it's a good place to start from. We're doing a lot of work on these optimization problems about, you know, how does that, you know, that's one component of it. But, uh, you know, how do you run the entire system and try to optimize this? What's the next generation of tools we need to do this? Uh, especially with the, the uh, variability and uncertainty that, that we're seeing added to the system from renewable energy. So why do you need a company like this? Well, I'm showing you here a whole month of weather data that's uh, sped up, obviously. You can see the days flashing by here. The pink dots that don't move here are uh, some existing large wind projects. So if you want to see what a given wind project will see, you can keep your eye on there and watch the weather flow over it. 
the colored particles that are flowing around here, uh, what we did is we, in this, we're looking at this model output from weather data, we actually released essentially a, a pretend particle into the atmosphere. And we're taking the slice of the atmosphere at hub height of wind turbines, about 100 meters above the ground. And we're color coding that particle based on its current speed, what speed is it being pushed around by the winds. So when it gets up to be like a pink or purple, that's up like, you know, 30, 35, 40 miles an hour. And uh, it, if it's slower, it would be in the blue colors. And then uh, what we're seeing with those, those wavy lines, those are the upper, upper air pressure levels. And what those are showing are the jet stream trends. The jet stream will tend to follow those, those pressure levels, kind of the troughs that will follow along. Every now and then you'll see a green shaded area coming down from there, which is when the jet stream actually comes down low enough to create a weather system. It will spin up weather like this big low pressure system here. And so the jet stream actually does a lot to create storm systems, right? And what you notice here are a couple things. Uh, first of all, if you watch those particles, you know, this is not an on or off. I, I don't really consider wind and solar energy to be intermittent, because to me that kind of means like a, you know, you just lost a transmission line in two cycles, right? That's very intermittent. But what you see is constant variability here, right? Uh, it's a flow. It's a fluid system. You know, it's a huge mass of air, right? So it doesn't like turn itself on and off instantly, but it's constantly flowing, constantly variable. The other thing you notice is that a lot of the energy that actually comes down into the, the surface level of those particles is driven by storm systems. So the jet stream will, will create a storm track. The, you know, the, the storms will tend to follow jet stream patterns. It will spin up these low pressure systems. And that's what's actually pulling a lot of the energy down from the upper air winds, the higher speed winds above, down to the surface. Right? So we're dependent on these, these weather systems to actually create a lot of the energy that gets down to wind turbines. Uh, and then we have to deal with this variability uh, of, of this huge fluid system. I mean, what is the atmosphere really? It's, uh, it really is a thin layer of fluid that's differentially heated by the sun. And the hotter areas will tend to get higher pressure, right? The winds will tend to flow from high pressure areas to low pressure areas. So you're creating the winds. But then you're putting this thin fluid layer on this, the ball, this huge globe, and you're spinning the whole thing. So you create all these complex patterns and flows, right? So it really is a very fluid circumstance. And uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty challenging, obviously, to look at all the different physics problems that are going on here and try to forecast that. But you know, we do have some ways of, of doing that that I'll show you. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, it's not always intuitive at first you know, what's going on in the atmosphere. For example, I'm sure you've heard a criticism of wind energy that yeah, it's great, but we get more of the energy at night than we do in the afternoon. We'd like, the, obviously, the power in the afternoon, but you know, wind tends to fall off in the afternoon. Well, OK, then uh, I ask you, so uh, if you're like going out golfing or fishing or whatever during the day here, usually you get up this time of day, and it's nice and calm, right? It's in the afternoon that the winds tend to pick up when you're on the golf course or out in the lake. So why, you, you just told me that there's more wind in the, uh, at night and less in the afternoon. I mean, what's going on? What's really happening here is that at night, there tends to be a real stable area that will kind of latch onto the surface here. So you, we're, we're down here at six feet inside this, this little, very stable layer that's attached to the surface, right? The wind turbines are up here at 80, 90 meters where uh, they're above that, and they'll, they'll see their highest speed winds there, because the, the wind, does, wind speed does tend to increase with height above ground in general. So they may be up here. It may be howling. It may be 40 miles an hour up at the top of the turbine, and it'll be dead calm at the base, right? But during the course of the day, of course, the sun comes out, usually, heats up the ground. It causes, essentially, convective mixing. What that's doing is it's mixing the higher speed winds from the, the up, upper atmosphere layers down toward the surface. So those move down to where we feel them. It's also essentially mixing the friction from the surface up into the swept area of the wind turbine. So it does tend to slow down up there. But this is a very, it's a very vertical phenomenon. It's all having to do with what they call the stability of the atmosphere, right? And depending on various stability parameters here in the atmosphere, how that atmosphere is behaving that day, you know, when does the sun come out? How hot is it relative to the other atmosphere? All this. All those can change this, this, the way that this sets up and the timing of all this. 
So an awful lot of the energy that actually hits wind turbines doesn't just propagate horizontally along the surface. It's really not the case you can just put a, you know, a measurement tower 30 miles upwind and measure the speed and figure out when that wind will get here. You know, that's, uh, that's a relatively small amount of the energy that's actually going to hit a wind turbine. An awful lot of it has to do with these vertical issues going on. Right? So that makes it somewhat non-intuitive. The other thing to keep in mind is that you know, we feel, you know, if we're down here at six feet, you know, we feel a lot of this gustiness in our face. Right? We feel those very short-term uh, patterns. Those, those are really just very minor turbulence issues that are causing that gustiness. If you put that across the whole area of a big wind turbine blade, you know, this, this does not change very quickly. The, those, are, those are very small uh, you know, disruptions in the atmosphere. So the amount of mass we're dealing with here is huge. You know, so it tends to be smoothed out where what a turbine will feel is much smoother than what we would feel in our face. What a whole wind plant that's spread out over several square miles will feel is smoothed out even more. And that applies, as we'll see, to both the, the variability of the power coming off of this and the uncertainty around forecast, because a lot of that will also average away. So if you're going to try to uh, do forecasting of this complex physics problem like this, I mean, you, you've got a lot going on. I mean, essentially, wind energy is solar energy just uh, in another derived form, right? Because it's caused by this differential heating, causes a lot of the pressure differences. But you've also got a lot of other things going on. You've got uh, literally, you know, cold air will flow down the slope coming, you know, coming down the bluffs and off the, off the North Shore. Uh, temperature differences between a large body of water and the land will create these pressure differences that will drive sea breeze effects, sea breeze winds. And then you've got you know, convective events where this, this hot, warm air rising will turn into a thunderstorm. right? And uh, all of these are very, very complex physics problems. So if you're going to try to predict you know, any of this, like the forecast for tomorrow, you know, where do you even start? Well, if you're going to put it on computers, what you want to do, first of all, is at least get it into a whole you know, matrix of points so you can represent the, the variables at each point in a computational way. So you divide the entire atmosphere up into a 3D matrix, actually. And then you say, well, I've got this huge grid. So now I can try to represent the atmospheric variables at each point in that, each corner point in that grid, basically. And you know, how well can you do that? Uh, well, we don't have measurements, of course, at every grid cell in something this big. But we do have quite a few weather measurements out there today. Uh, obviously, you know, airports always tend to have a weather station, usually at 10 meters above the ground, to measure wind speed and direction and pressure and humidity of rainfall and so forth. I mean, you'll see a lot of these other west weather stations along the highway when you're driving around, too, that are spread out all over the place. Uh, they do balloon launches a few places in the country every, you know, at least several times a day to get a whole profile going up. They, they have special instruments called uh, radar profilers that sit on the ground and actually get a measurements of the colony atmosphere up for maybe 20 miles. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have satellites today. A lot of satellites are measuring all sorts of weather variables and uh, able to infer a lot to, about temperature, different levels of atmosphere, even some wind speed and direction type issues. And then the, even the uh, commercial aircraft, for the last 20 years or more, uh, commercial aircraft have been actually collecting and sending back a profile of the atmosphere every time they take off and land. And it turns out that this is gathered all around the globe. All the different weather services in the, in the world share this data with each other. And then that's, that becomes very useful because using the laws of physics to represent all of those, those things going on as, as best we can, you can actually take you know, those thousands of measurements we do get every hour and you can use physics to essentially do a smart interpolation and fill in the gap and say, you know, based on what I'm, I'm measuring, what must the variables be in the other points in this, this three-dimensional three three matrix in order to come up with a physically consistent snapshot of the atmosphere right now. So this is a process called assimilation. And it actually gives you a pretty good representation of the entire space, even though you have you know, just a limited number of measurements, right? So if that's, if that's the initial starting point, now if I want to actually forecast the weather, then what I do is I represent those laws of physics also in the computers as partial differential equations, actually. And what you're really doing is you're doing a state transition. You say, I know what the state of the atmosphere is right now, and I know a pretty good representation of what the physical phenomenon are, and I can represent those, those physical changes and incoming rates of you know, solar radiation and all that. 
I can, I can represent all that on a computer and do a state transition and say, if I know what it is now, what is it going to be 10 seconds from now? What's it going to be 10 seconds later? And just do the state transition. And this is actually how a weather forecast model runs. Uh, technically, it's a, it's a large-scale computational fluid dynamics model, uh, meaning it's a physics-based simulation, basically. And if you let this run out for tomorrow, that's exactly how they get the forecast that they're going to talk about you know, on TV tonight to tell us what's going to happen tomorrow afternoon. It turns out you can represent these laws of physics pretty well. I mean, obviously, there's some error involved. But it's, uh, the forecasts actually work, once you understand the complexity of what's going on here, they work amazingly well for several days, you know, maybe out to five or six days even. Uh, after a while, you know, any little error or any little measurement uh, error will, will catch up with you in these physics models, and it'll start to deviate. So the next, you know, they'll run it out maybe for 14 or 15 days. The first week is pretty good. Second week, uh, not as good, right? Because uh, the errors start accumulating. But they run amazingly well. Uh, and, and people have been improving on this for decades. This has been going on for as long as we've had the ability to, to compute, basically. Uh, and the quality of the forecast is constantly evolving and getting better. So it's actually, uh, you know, I think they say the forecast for going out for two or three days now is as good as it was just for one day ahead, you know, 20 years ago. So it's constantly getting better. That really is what a weather forecast model is. Uh, now, there's different types of models you want to go up beyond two weeks, because you can't just do a detailed physics simulation in that case. But we'll, we'll talk about those when we talk about climate in just a minute. That makes sense? Please feel free to uh, you know, jump in with questions anytime. We've got plenty of time just to have an open discussion if we go through this. Most of it is shared. Uh, here in the, in the United States, the, uh, the, these weather data systems and the forecast models and the output are actually done by, by NOAA. And the National Weather Service is part of, part of NOAA, National, Atmosp uh, National Atmospheric and uh, oh, no, Oceanographic. It's oceans and atmosphere and something, yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, right? Yeah, which is technically, by the way, part of the Department of Commerce for historical reasons, which we shall not get into. Uh, but NOAA you know, does both the, the wet stuff in the ocean and the atmospheric stuff. And uh, we're supporting that with taxpayer dollars, and they essentially make all that freely available. It's uh, available on the web. Obviously, the outputs of these models are huge 3D environmental data sets. You can download load them, but you have to have special tools to do anything with them like we do. So, you know, typically what you're seeing on the uh, internet would be just, you know, slices or derived pictures, animations from those models. Uh, in other countries, the, the countries will often fund a National Weather Service, but they might actually charge people to get the output from the models. So it varies around the globe in terms of how accessible it is, but it's very accessible here in, uh, in the United States and North America. So this turns out to be very useful. Uh, it turns out they, they actually run different types of weather models. So uh, NOAA actually runs several. NOAA, NOAA has a group called the National Center for Envir Environmental Prediction, NSEP, which is where they have the huge supercomputers and they run a whole suite of these models constantly. Uh, some of them run out for the full 15 days, maybe at three or four hour time steps in terms of how they deliver the data. Other models are two and more for hour by hour going out for the first day. Uh, different resolutions, somewhat different data input. I mentioned, uh, like uh, in Europe, there's a consortium called ECMWF that does a very good model that a lot of us here in the US use as well. And then a lot of the countries like France and Spain, Canada, uh, they all have their own weather systems and their own weather models as well. Uh, and then there's a whole private sector that is built up around weather as well. So WindLogix would te technically be considered one of the private sector meteorology companies. Uh, but a lot of these companies are out there. They're doing road weather. They're doing you know, load forecasting weather feeds, uh, emergency weather for particular businesses. These private companies may run their own weather models today because computers are cheap enough now we can actually get the power to run our own. But uh, often cases, they'll be do doing the, kind of that last mile optimization of taking general weather data and applying it to a particular business problem. So there's a lot of people in this private sector as well. And the other thing you can do that's interesting with these models, uh, I mean, this shows that you're often going to run essentially a global model or, a, or cover the, at least the entire country with your outer grid here relatively coarsely. And then you run higher resolution inner nests. 
where you might have a much higher resolution portion inside that model. And these get very tricky. They, they'll actually exchange data as they run across those, those borders. And this allows you to actually zoom in and get much more fidelity, much more information about a particular area of interest uh, without having to compute the entire grid at that resolution. Because the compu computing power just explodes. The, uh, the amount of computers you need goes up with a cube of the, of the resolution. You know, so if you uh, double the resolution, the, the computing time goes up by a factor of eight, right? So you've got to be uh, judicious about how you do this. And then it's also interesting because those, the starting point for these forecasts, you recall, was a snapshot of the atmosphere. Well, that's pretty useful to have these snapshots of the atmosphere going back in time, right? And it turns out people are actually taking those and refining them even more to create a very consistent set of snapshots, like hour by hour going back for 40 years now, which is extremely useful, as we'll talk about, for a couple of different, uh, different things we want to do. Okay? And for satellite, uh, for, uh, for solar rather, we'll talk about uh, solar as well. Obviously, because solar is really driven by clouds, and clouds actually appear quite nicely on satellite images, uh, these same sort of historical snapshots of satellite imagery are often used to derive long-term understanding about what's going to happen with future solar projects. Okay. Oops. The other thing you can do, I mentioned these hourly snapshots. Uh, what's been very interesting, a development we, we started doing back around 2003 or so in the, uh, the integration studies. You know, people were interested about you know, what would it be like if we had 30% uh, wind energy uh, in Minnesota, right? So we were looking at this problem and uh, actually ran into one of the, uh, the electrical engineers who were doing a lot of these the simulation of these things, you know, essentially using tools like ProMod or now uh, uh, Plexos, you know, to, to run, kind of rerun your whole operation of the power system and put it in different scenarios. And we came up with a way of saying, you know, well, wouldn't it be really cool to be able to pretend that we already had all that wind energy uh, in the state? And, but how could we actually know exactly how much power it would produce when? Because if we could actually take, you know, the historical load data every five minutes, and if we could simulate very accurately the power injected from every wind plant every five minutes, well, then we could run all these scenarios and just redispatch the system and come up with, you know, what's the cost of serving load? You know, how well will the system hold up with us? What would change in terms of how other units are run? Well, that's exactly what we did. We took those historical snapshots of the atmosphere. We reran this on these models using historical snapshots, you know, rather than the new ones. And we used these models to fill in the gaps between those snapshots. And because the model is running continuously, we can pull data out every five or 10 minutes. You know, as much, as much disk space as you want to throw at us, we can fill it with data and pull this out. And then you can get very detailed understanding at every location where you want to hypothetically put a wind plant uh, of the wind speed and, and direction and so forth and simulate that uh, power conversion of the wind plant and come out with a five minute time series of wind plants that don't even exist. And it turns out this can be done with, with a pretty high degree of accuracy that allows you to simulate all this. So very, very useful to do this. Now, if you're gonna actually build a wind project, uh, you know, it's great to have these, these models and all these large scale snapshots and they're pretty good, but you know, we're trying to build wind projects at particular places that have the best possible winds. So they might be up on a pretty small ridge or structure where it would be a little different than the, the average around it. So you really wanna get on-site measurements so you know exactly what's going to happen at the wind project and you can do any little tuning or correction of these, these larger models. The standard way of doing that historically is to put up a, a MET tower kind of like this, or often it's a, a tubular steel pop-up tower now, 60 meters tall usually today. And it will have instruments at several different levels. So it may, you know, we'll have a, a logger down here at the bottom that collects the data and sends it back to us through like a cell phone data link or a satellite data link. But then you'll have not only instruments at 10 meters, but you'll have them at 30, 40, 50, 60 measuring the wind speed because it's very important to figure out how does the wind speed increase as it goes up at this site. This is great. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the limitations, but uh, you, know, you, you wanna have on-site data for at least a year before you're going to try to combine all this together and understand this project. 
It's nice, but you can really only get up to about 60 meters at reasonable cost. Uh, this might cost about $30,000 $30, or so to put up one of these towers for a year. But you know, wind turbines today are at hub heights that are up at 80 or 90 meters commonly. And the blades are also 80 meters in diameter. So we really would love to know what's going on up at 100 and 120 meters. And the Met Tower doesn't get you there. So you can take those multiple levels and try to extrapolate up, but there's some error in doing that. So more and more now, we're also combining that, those Met Towers with remote sensing devices. Like this is a, a SODAR-based device. Uh, it's you know size of a couple of these tables here kind of thing. What it does is it, it, it does pings of a, a sound signal that it sends up in three focused directions. And it, that's, that sound bounces off of particles in the atmosphere and comes back, at least you know, a portion of it will come back where you can detect it. And you actually use the Doppler shift of those beams to infer the wind speed and direction all the way up to about 150 meters or so. And it works pretty well today. That's about $50,000 to put one of those out. Runs on solar panels and batteries, so we, we, we use a lot of those today and put them around to complement the Met Towers to get up to the, the higher heights above ground level. The devices in the bottom here are different forms of laser-based remote sensing devices that do something similar. They're called LiDAR systems. They'll actually use several laser beams, and that, that beam will reflect off of turbulence or, or molecules or particles in the atmosphere and give you that same sort of Doppler shift. So you can actually infer you know, wind speed at different levels all the way up. Uh, with a device like this, uh, about, about $200,000, it will get you up to uh, 250 meters, 300 meters or so. They make higher power ones used around airports to detect wind shear that go up to several miles, but they might cost a million dollars. So it's still kind of pricey. We don't use a lot of them, but uh, we, we're looking for the prices to come down so we can do more of that and actually understand the whole swept area of the blade and, of course, get out and not just measure one or a few sites at a, a large project, which will cover many square miles, but get more points across the project. Now, if you're going to do something on a solar project, if it's a large solar project, uh, same thing. You know, if it's, uh, if it's more than just a couple megawatts or so of solar, uh, you know, you're talking quite a bit of money. So you're going to get on-site measurement as well. Now, with solar, you know, it's going to be driven by this, what's the intensity of the sun, the irradiance, we call it, coming down to that site. And you can measure solar irradiance with a pretty cheap little photodiode. You know, you shine light on it, it creates current. You measure that current to... Uh, you know, determine how much sun that, that was. The trick is that when you're building projects, it's very useful to know something about you know, how much of the sun is actually coming directly from the sun to me, and how much of that sun is actually bouncing off of haze or particles or clouds or other things before it gets to me. And it turns out you can do that fairly inexpensively with a device like this called a shadow band radiometer. So this combines a photodiode, which is in the, the top area up here. And then it's got this funky looking windshield wiper blade. And what that does is every you know, couple times a minute, that will just kind of sweep over. And it will shade the photodiode for a fraction of a second. But these photodiodes react so quickly that that's enough to actually determine what's the difference between the direct sun I'm getting and you know, plus all, everything else. And once I'm shaded, then I'm only measuring the, 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 the dispersed part, right? The non-direct part. And you can go through the math and figure out, okay, how much is the direct normal, which is the direct sunbeam, how much of it is the, the dispersed, the diffuse. And that makes up your global, your total amount of, of solar energy you're getting there. And that's usually a great instrument, gives us all the data we need to do a lot of the, like the photovoltaic, the PV type solar projects. If you're doing a, a large concentrating solar thermal project, and I'll show you pictures of some of these in a moment, then you might, you know, you're much more concerned because if it's, if it's a, a concentrating project of any type, you can only focus the beam if it's coming at you directly in parallel, right? And so you measure with a device that actually tracks the sun, points directly at it, and measures the, the direct solar intensity there. This is a much uh, more sensitive, more expensive device, you know, 100,000 or so, and you gotta clean it every day to get good data. You know, so you're only going to use it for larger uh, concentrating solar projects like in the desert southwest usually. We probably won't see too many of those around, around the Midwest here. Make sense? So that's kind of a background, a quick, okay, now you know enough about weather to uh, entertain people at cocktail parties anyway. And uh, 
and about how we start getting the data. Before we get into turning that weather into power, let's just take a slight diversion into climate. You know, what's the difference between weather and climate? And that's, this is also pretty simple. I mean, climate is what you expect. You know, what's the normal for this time of year, right? And weather is what you actually get. And the weather signal is very noisy on top of this underlying climate trend, right? So climate would be based on the long-term normals, the smooth values of you know, what's typical, right? But it's often kind of difficult to see that in our day-to-day -day weather because there's, there's a lot of, you know, every storm system is a, it's kind of a noise event on there and they all kind of tend to the average, but they're gonna create a lot of noise signal. Now this, where this gets interesting is that, uh, you know, there's these things called climate indices out there. And a, a climate index uh, people have discovered several dozen of these by looking very carefully at historical data. And fundamentally, most of them are driven by the fact that although the atmosphere is a huge mass and absorbs a huge amount of thermal energy from the sun, the oceans are an even larger mass and absorb even more energy, right? And it turns out that uh, you know, these oceans absorb all this heat that, that heat is then moved around by the, uh, you know, the, the Gulf streams and other patterns in the ocean itself. And then under various conditions, that energy is going to come back out of the ocean into the atmosphere and fuel a lot of the, the weather going on in the atmosphere from, from temperature drip, you know, that thermal energy is a huge driver of this. And, and how, that, how that thermal energy gets translated from the oceans back into the atmosphere is a huge driver of this. So these patterns, you'll, you'll hear about the ENSO cycle, El Nino, La Nina, I'll talk about in a minute. But there's also, there's lots of others, the North Atlantic Oscillation, which impacts Europe a lot, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, very long-term trends driven by these, these streams. So why is this important? Well, here's a good example. The, the El Nino, La Nina sort of event is probably the most well-known of these. This is not something you can actually predict very well, but once it sets up, you can measure it and know that you're in it, and you tend to stay in it for six or nine months or whatever before it tends to fade and either go neutral or the other direction. El Nino is when in the South Pacific, the temperature of the ocean there gets just a couple of degrees warmer than normal. It doesn't take too much, it's just a few degrees. But when that gets warmer, the atmosphere above it gets warmer, when the atmosphere above it gets warmer, it develops higher pressure. And that high pressure dome will tend to sit there and get so big, it will go all the way up in the stratosphere and it will actually divert the jet streams because the jet streams have to move around this huge dome of high pressure, right? And so instead of a pattern that would have gone down through this area and then come back up across the country or whatever, this, this jet stream we're looking at here actually has to go up around it and then it follows it back down and gets pulled down below the country. So it actually changes these jet stream patterns. Now it's not 100% on or off, it's just, you know, this is going to be a driver of a tendency for the jet stream to get into this, this pattern. And, uh, and, you know, so it might impact it, you know, our weather by five or 10%, you know, in terms of the weather we actually see. But that's pretty significant. And why is that significant to our weather? Well, the, the normal patterns we see in the Midwest here, you know, a lot of our, our wind and weather tends to come from the Northwest around here, a lot of the time, right? So our prevailing patterns are, are these solid ones. It will change a little bit in terms of how it tends to set up, you know, winter versus summer, but, you know, bottom line is that's, that's pulling a lot of uh, wind and weather, you know, through the center of the country. The other pattern that we see sometimes is that we'll get the, a southern track, those dotted lines, uh, like, for example, you'll hear about this, uh, a big blizzard event, right? If it, you get a major blizzard or uh, tornado events, you know, coming from the southwest often, those, those more severe storms, they get more severe because they pull a lot of the heat and moisture from the Gulf into that rotating low pressure system and pull a lot of that moisture up and create our blizzards, right, among other things. But the key point here is that, you know, this, we tend to have these jet stream tracks that tend to cross right through the center of the continent. That's why, really, uh, we have a lot of great wind energy all along that whole centerpiece of the country because it pulls all those weather systems. Those weather systems pull the energy down and put the wind in the turbines. So we get a lot of weather through here. It's, not, you know, it's really the case that the weather is more interesting around here for some people. A lot of weather happens here. 
But what happens if you get into a strong El Nino year? Whoops. Well, that jet stream track that would have actually come up and across around here actually gets diverted down south. And so Florida will get a lot more weather and rain than normal. But uh, the jet streams actually, because of the way they're moving around that, that big high pressure system, end up going either north or south instead of crossing, right? So we end up with this, this you know, a tendency here in the center of the country to have less, you know, fewer weather systems coming through. Therefore, we tend to get you know, less windy, drier, you know, fewer storm systems on average. And we'll, we'll essentially have this kind of storm drought uh, that's because of this diversion of the jet, the jet stream pattern. Okay? And again, it's not like it's totally you know, chilling wind, but it might knock it down for a, a season or two by 5, 5%, 6%, you know, just based on this particular index alone. All these other indices are also going on, and these all interact. And you can trace back a certain amount of the you know, wind power variability we see to a pattern like this. You know, maybe it's 10%, right, that you could attribute to something like this. But it's enough to, to think about. I'm having trouble with this today. I'm going to screw up your presentation for the university. <laughs> so what happens here is that you know, the, the top line is showing like a 30-year annual wind power output for a Midwestern wind plant, right? And you know, we see this uh, maybe 8% year-to-year sort of standard deviation of variability. You know, it's gonna bounce around within that. Uh, similar with, with solar, as we'll discuss as well. In fact, if you look at this for uh, kind of taking like 30 years of data and actually predicting you know, what's the normal uh, through the seasons of the year, through the months of the year here, you know, we see a definitely a monthly pattern as well. And this, this white dashed line is kind of your long-term average of what, what you would expect to see in wind power at this particular site, right? But if you look at all the variability, uh, you'll see this window of, uh, of basically uncertainty around that. And a, a, a given year will be like these lines here. This is one single year expressed like somewhat different ways. And it will bounce around within this, this envelope of, of distribution of what you'd expect. The top line here would be a, a P99, and the bottom would be, a, I mean, a P, P1 actually, and a P99 in the bottom. Meaning that you know, one year out of 100, we'd expect to see the monthly output to be up at that level or down at this level. But most of the time, it's going to bounce around across, you know, around the mean. But there is a fair amount of variability even within a year on a month-to-month -month basis. Any questions on, on that and how, how climate drives this as well? Now we're going to, to move into actually creating some power with this stuff. Yeah, question, question is, have we seen a lot of El Ninos? Uh, you know, it's the most well understood of the climate indices. So uh, people, you, you do see it in the news all the time. Uh, I mean, we're in kind of a neutral phase right now. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't think we're seeing any more. I think we just are becoming aware of it, about, about measuring it. You know, it's always been there. These are not new things. They've been going on for way, way before people have been around kind of stuff. You know, it's just this interaction of the huge oceans and the, the atmosphere. So I don't think we're seeing any more. Uh, some of these are, are tricky, though, uh, like the, uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. I mean, people know that it's there, but the one that we're in now has lasted like 30 years, I believe. You know, so, <laughs> so it's, you, you can't always predict when they're going to change. Uh, you can kind of detect when you're in them. But, uh, they have some predictive ability. We actually look at some of these now when we're trying to do like seasonal or year ahead projections. But those are going to be uh, like anything with climate. They're going to be more statistical of saying, you know, based on what we can figure out, you know, we think uh, the next quarter is going to be, uh, you know, 10% below normal or, you know, 5% above normal. And, uh, and usually we're, you know, in the ballpark, but you're not going to be precise. Yes, sir. Yeah. And then we have the question of, well, with global warming, how are these winds, how are the winds trending? Is, right. Is that expected to go forward? Yeah. So the quest question is, you know, with, with global warming, you know, is the historical average uh, really going to change? Uh, 
Yeah, people are constantly asking me, you know, well, for my wind project right here, you know, with this, this global warming, you know, is it going to get more or less windy? And the answer is always yes. Uh, but trying to, trying to predict exactly how, you know, a, a lot of it is going to depend on these jet stream tendencies. I mean, the big concern people have is, you know, do you eventually kind of hit the wall with you know, one of these index type things where it's a permanent shift in a jet stream and not just a, a temporary one or, or nudging it around. It actually completely changes the pattern. For example, uh, you know, in Europe, you know, the, the reason at the same latitude, you know, it's much warmer in Europe than it is here, right? You know, I think uh, what uh, Stockholm is you know, well north of, of us here kind of stuff, right? And, uh, and that's driven by you know, a lot of the heat from the Gulf goes up in the Gulf Stream and ends up warming northern Europe. Well, you know, what if things change with the ocean flows or with, uh, you know, with fresh water coming off of Greenland ice sheets melting and it actually stops the Gulf Stream? Well, all of a sudden, northern Europe would become way, way colder than it is today. You know, but how do you predict those things? Uh, very difficult. So it could, you know, these, these change in these patterns, obviously it, it changes the, uh, the storm tracks, changes all this stuff. So you could eventually have a, a major change in the weather patterns or in the, the windiness of a wind project. But, you know, it's not going to happen, you know, in a matter of a couple of years. I mean, we're talking decades or centuries. So, you know, all we can do today is build them where we think they're best. And, uh, you know, hopefully we get 25, 30 years out of them before we have to worry about anything significant in terms of the payback on, on that investment. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the question is if we build a lot of wind plants uh, and they're extracting some of this kinetic energy from the wind flow, does that actually change the, the weather or the climate tendencies? Uh, I mean, the first thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, the atmosphere is a big place with a huge mass of air, and we're only you know, building relatively small projects, of course, at, at a very you know, low level in the atmosphere. So, I mean, people are studying it because uh, the, the wind turbines will uh, create some turbulence, of course, as they extract this, just like any building or uh, you know, putting on a, a, a windbreak of trees or anything will. It will create turbulence. That turbulence will create more mixing, and so it will tend to mix uh, higher speed winds down with surface area winds. So you do get uh, kind of a moderation of the nighttime temperature you know, near a wind plant just from this mixing. Same reason why they would run fans in a, you know, a vineyard to prevent the crop from freezing, right? You know, they turn on this mixing. You know, so you're gonna have some real local, you know, I like to say that just near a wind turbine, uh, a wind plant, you're gonna have a somewhat more Mediterranean climate, which is not, you know, a lot of farmers look at this and say, well, that's pretty good. My crops actually grow better because of that. In fact, uh, down at the University of Iowa, we're cooperating where they're putting measurements out at a large wind project down in Northern Iowa, and they're actually measuring that. What's interesting is uh, it's not just the wind turbines that impact crops, it's crops that impact wind turbines too, because like depending on how tall is the corn, or did they plant corn versus soybeans in the fields around these wind turbines, we're getting to the point where we can actually measure the difference in power output at wind turbines depending on what the crop is that year. You know, again, it's not huge, but it's a few percent. So I, I don't, you know, I'm not overly concerned in any way about uh, the, the very small slice of energy we're taking out of the atmosphere. And, and we do the same thing when we build a city or a skyscraper, you know, you gotta keep it in, in context here. So it does have some local effect that's being studied. I, I'm not too worried about it actually being a driver of climate change itself in any way. Okay, well, let's, let's make some energy with this stuff. Uh, I mean, a challenge when you get into uh, this, this you know, wind and solar variable generation uh, is that uh, you know, it has this, because it's driven by the weather as its fuel source, and because the weather has uncertainty and has, you know, errors around forecasting it, of course, the fuel source is going to have those same sort of errors. 
And as we'll see, it's actually magnified because in most cases, the, uh, the power that we're getting at that instant varies with the cube of the wind speed. So any little error in wind speed will be magnified, right? So we've got these implicit characteristics of uh, largely uncertainty and variability that we have to deal with. But we have to keep in mind as, as uh, people in the power industry that uh, you know, all power plants and fuels have their own intrinsic characteristics, right? We've gotten used to a lot of these over the decades, but uh, you, know, you can only do certain things with hydro plants, right? You've got, you've got other constraints on those flows and, and what you can do. We've got lots of constraints actually on thermal units that we've become very comfortable with, but when you think about it, you know, while well, you've got the, the minimum run times, you've got startup times and costs, you've got, you know, all sorts of ramp rate limitations. You can only you can only vary their output so quickly, you know, or nuclear plant, you've got even more limitations perhaps on ramping. You know, so all of these things are are constraints. And uh, and we've also always had, you know, variability and uncertainty in the power system, often driven by load. Uh, and, and, and we've had uncertainty even in highly reliable plants like, like uh, nuclear plants and transmission lines, of course, that we cover with contingency reserves, right? Because we might lose any of, any of those in a fraction of a second. We have to be ready for it. So none of this is new, but what I think the great thing about wind energy in particular has been is that it's become a catalyst for kind of questioning our assumptions and forcing us to go back and look at this whole issue around uncertainty and variability in the power system. Uh, and say, you know, are we doing it right? Because we, we will have some additional uncertainty and variability added, of course, by wind and solar. Uh, is there a more elegant way of engineering this, a more, a more elegant approach that allows us to do this? Do we need the next generation of tools that are going to be more probabilistic in nature to deal with this? You know, so it's forcing a lot of very interesting creative work in the power system. Just to understand briefly, in the case of wind, you know, what's going on here. Uh, the power curve for wind turbine, this, this black line you see coming up and then flattening out, uh, a wind turbine will start creating power at a few miles per hour. It will start spinning, but it won't create very much. It, it will ramp up very quickly, actually with the cube of the wind speed uh, in that steep part of the power curve until it gets up to the flat plateau where it's maxing out the generator that you have. And then it will run flat at that generated rated, rated output up until about 55 miles an hour when it has to shut down to protect the equipment, just the stresses on the equipment and drivetrain. The amount of energy you can extract is actually limited by something called the Betts Law. And uh, the simple way of looking at this is that uh, we, we can't take 100% of the kinetic energy out of the wind. Why is that? Well, if you did, then on the downwind side of the turbine, the wind would just sit there, right? It wouldn't be able to get out of the way. And that would back up the wind, create pressure, you know, so none of the wind would be coming in anymore. So you've got to leave, essentially, a, a layman's way of, of looking at this, you've got to leave enough energy so the, the downstream wind can get out of the way so the new energy can come in. And that ends up being about 59% of the, the total kinetic energy that's in the atmosphere there in the winds. And it turns out that these, these upwind three-bladed turbines, even though they look like they have a huge amount of space between the blades and so forth, they're actually getting pretty close to this. I think they're well up in the 50s in terms of the amount of energy they extract. Right? Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, you know, we, could, we could create a turbine that operated up on that flat rated part essentially all the time if we just put in really, really big blades and a really small generator. But that's not the most cost effective way of building wind turbine. Wind turbines are designed to get the maxim maximum amount of energy production per dollar. And so usually what you're doing is uh, spending most of your time on that steepest part of the power curve because that's where it's you know, most economic when you run all the math in terms of the cost of the equipment versus power output. Now that's great for energy production. It's, uh, it's not so great for those of us who have to forecast it because any small change, any small error in the wind speed will be magnified dramatically going to power with this cubic relationship, right? And people care. I mean, we're, you know, a lot of the instruments that we have to deal with have a, you know, standard error of a couple percent in measuring winds, yet we've got people all the time saying, no, you got to tell me, is it 8.0 or is it 8.1 meters per second at this site? You know, we try, but uh, you're pushing the limits of, of any measurement technology, to be honest about it. I'll talk more about some of these other issues, uh, capacity factor, in a minute, but uh, keep in mind also that uh, we got this wind shear issue, that winds tends to get higher with, with height above ground, and we'll talk about power trade-offs in a moment. 
The other thing is, it's not just the wind characteristics, it's the location and the terrain as well. I mentioned the crop difference, you know, just that frictional difference under turbines actually is propagated up into the, the swept area of the turbines. But the terrain itself, you know, just the flow. Uh, you know, in the old Palm Springs development, I mean, they were just jamming turbines out there in the desert. They would just put one row after another. I mean, we would never do that anymore because, of course, the, uh, the wind turbine is taking energy out of the wind flow. If it's taking this 50-some percent of the energy out, there's actually a, essentially a, a wake, a, an envelope of lower energy behind the wind turbine, right? Well, it turns out that that, that deficit, that wake deficit, will, pro will stay there and meander around like a, just like a kind of wake behind a boat kind of thing for quite a ways downwind. I mean, you never want to put one turbine closer on the prevailing wind direction, closer than about 10 rotor diameters. You know, so on the order of a kilometer or so between these, quite a ways apart. Uh, but under some atmospheric conditions, we're now measuring that even, you know, that goes even further. It will stay around for quite a while. In fact, even if there's a new wind plant that's now built like 10 miles up the road, we can actually detect that in the data from our wind plants coming here. I didn't, I didn't mention, by the way, that uh, we have a lot of data to work with because Next Air Energy, our parent company, is the largest developer, owner, and operator of wind plants in North America, over 10,000 megawatts of wind that they own themselves. And of course, they've, uh, they've done projects with Minnesota Power here, and you're doing a lot of great projects yourself in North Dakota and becoming very, very knowledgeable on this. But it's great for a company like, like ours at WindLogix, who has to figure all this out to have that data, that actual SCADA data, to see what's going on and to analyze all that and close the loop on what we thought it was going to do pre-construction, what it does afterwards. And we're finding that it actually is more complicated. These wakes are a big issue of research right now. But then the land itself, you know, we'll try to put it up on uh, more elevated, like smooth ridge lines are nice because you get a little, you know, speed up, a Bernoulli kind of effect of the, the atmosphere flowing over the top of that ridge or down the, the back side of that ridge. Uh, you've got all this variability, these changes through the seasons. I mean, theoretically, you'd even change how you lay out turbines, you know, based on are you on a time of day rate versus a, a flat rate, because the wind patterns distributions might vary with season and time. And power might be more valuable, uh, even though it's not, you know, maybe the uh, the prevailing wind direction. So you might optimize for something else if you get that sophisticated. And the problem, of course, is that you know a lot of these projects today are you know half a billion dollar wind projects. You're putting in like 500 megawatts of wind turbines. Uh, you can't move them once they're planted. They're, you know, they're going to stay there for uh, at least a 25-year engineered life. And you're pretty much stuck with it. And then you have to go to a banker and convince them that they ought to put up you know, $500 million on this project based on a few measurements you did out in the field and convince them that you know what you're doing on their cash flows for the next 20 years. So it's a little bit challenging. Uh, but that's basically what we do. And then, of course, once you can understand this variability and uncertainty, then that really gets into operations as well that we'll talk about a lot. You know, how do we deal with that when we're, we're actually setting up our system day ahead? How are we going to put this into the markets? Things like that. So it's a good problem. The traditional way, as I mentioned, was to do this measure, correlate, predict. You would put up a MET tower. You'd measure for a year. You'd correlate it with a, an airport that hopefully had a consistent measurement for at least 10 or 15 years. And from that, you would turn this, this relatively short-term measurement at site, you know, maybe for a year, into what you think the, the 20 or 25-year project would do. And this has been done for a long time. Uh, the problem is, as I mentioned here, uh, you know, we've got this MET tower, first of all, which isn't as tall as the turbines. Uh, we only get this snapshot of maybe a year of data. The anemometers that measure the wind speed are not perfect. They ice up. We get days where we don't get any data. We have to figure out what to do with that. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, it's not, it's not measuring exactly what a wind turbine is going to see, right? And then similarly, the airports, you know, we're, we're trying to build these projects at the windiest special spots we can find. And we don't tend to put airports where it's as windy as possible. We tend to put that down in the valleys, or at least the flat areas up on top of the hill here, you know, where you can land a plane and it's not going to be overly, overly energetic. Uh, also, the equipment is down at 10 meters. And uh, 
I mean, what happens with airports? You, you initially build it out in the middle of nowhere because that's where you got the space, but then people want to build stuff around it or the trees grow around it or things change and they start shading those, those wind speed measurements. So they're not perfect. Often you'll upgrade the equipment every six or eight years. They say, well, I got this great new measurement device now, I'm gonna change over to this. Well, that's great, but it's not perfectly aligned with the measurements you got before. So you end up with this step change. So it, it's really difficult given the accuracy of what we're trying to do here to make this work. So really in a nutshell, this, this is a one slide version of uh, what was the, the WindLogic's business plan back in 2002 which just said, you know, let's do this better. And now there's various companies out there that are doing things along these lines. So we've got this year of on-site data, but let's not forget about all those weather archives, those those hour by hour snapshots of the atmosphere. Let's not forget about the fact that we can combine those high resolution models with topography and data and roughness data about the crops and all that, and actually model all that together today and create at least a year of really, really understanding what's going to happen through the entire space of the project. And then we've got those long-term, you know, 40-year kind of data sets. Well, those are a lot better than an airport tower to try to adjust that data to a long-term normal, to, to normalize it out to 30 or 40 years. And the way we actually do it here is by the time we're done, we're, we're essentially doing an hour-by-hour -hour simulation of exactly what that wooden project would have done for at least 30 years before we come up with our numbers about what it's going to do for the next 20 or 30, okay? So yeah, you're depending on the stability of the climate to some extent, but you know, how can you do any better than that right now with the data we have, really? So we've turned this from just kind of a statistical linear correlation problem of the measure correlate predict into more of a, a physics-based simulation, not only of the weather, but of the wind project itself, right? And you get, you know, like a real high resolution. We'll model these projects down to about 60 meters now. So you've got data from every site, where, every spot where you're going to put a turbine. And you can start modeling all the individual turbines and how they interact with each other and be simulating the entire wind plant. And so it's come a long way over the last 10 years in terms of the sophistication about how we try to do the data analysis even before we build a project. The other thing I mentioned is, uh, you know, the, the wind speed goes up as you go higher above the ground. Uh, and so you'd want to put in taller towers because you will get more energy, but you have to trade that off against the fact that a taller tower gets a lot more expensive. It uses a lot more steel as you go taller. And so there's a cost benefit trade off all the time on this. So yeah, we can get a lot more energy if we go higher, but is the, the cost worth it or not? Uh, we can also put on longer blades today. A lot of the advancements and the, the better cost of energy from wind turbines over the last few years has been putting much longer blades and uh, being able to still have maintainable equipment that can handle those stresses uh, with the same, often the same uh, generators. Uh, so you can increase the amount of energy, but again, a longer blade is gonna cost more. So where's the break even on that? So that's the sort of analysis we do. You know, what model of turbine, what, what blade size, what tower height, lots of options. There's also this thing called the capacity factor that comes into play here. And you'll, you'll often hear about, well, this, this wind project has a 40% capacity factor and this one is 36. You know, what are they talking about there? There's actually two forms of capacity factor. Uh, the, the first, the gross capacity factor, is really just kind of based primarily on the wind resource and kind of the, a single, you know, perfect wind turbine, right, from this manufacturer. The, the, wind, the, the manufacturer of the wind turbine, the OEM, will give you a power curve, a manufacturer's power curve, which is what, what they claim and warranty it will produce. For, for this wind speed, it will produce this much power. And often that may be, a, it may vary based on, uh, on air density kind of issues a little bit as well. So that's the starting point. But then when you actually put real turbines out there and you put multiple ones that in, interact with each other, then you've got to worry about these wakes. You know, okay, given my layout and how closely I'm spacing them, how much energy will they lose because of the, the waking effect between them? Uh, what availability will they really have? You know, are they going to be down, you know, one or two percent or, or four or five percent of the time for maintenance? Uh, is the power curve perfect, you know, or not? Maybe there's some error there or they, there are certain conditions that are special at this site. Electrical losses, uh, you know, the turbine is going to have a generator, it's going to have a collector system at moderate voltage that goes to, uh, you know, often to a substation where it will be going up to line voltage, go to the meter, right? Uh, 
well, there's losses in the collector system, electrical losses. Uh, even on the blades, if it's a site where you get a lot of bugs or dust building up on the blade, the blade is essentially a huge wing. As you uh, get any you know, roughness on that blade, it will degrade the aerodynamic efficiency of that blade. So you'll actually get a, a slight decrease in power output from that. Yes, sir? Yeah, bullet holes. Uh, that doesn't help. Uh, yeah, but you'll, they'll get pitted. You know, uh, in dusty areas, they'll get pitted over time from the dust, and you'll have to wait. You know, do I go up there and coat those again and do a lot of maintenance? Uh, so you end up with all these losses that are going to take a, a chunk away and come up with this net capacity factor. Net capacity factor is okay. How much are you left with actually at the revenue meter? And this is usually expressed as a percentage. So if a if you talk about like a 40% NCF, you know, what you're comparing it against is 100% would be, you know, what if there was enough wind to run the generator flat out every hour of the year, right? And the NCF is, okay, how much of that maximum, you know, generator rated capacity do you actually get in the course of a typical year, right? Make sense? And often these numbers, uh, I mean, we, we got some great wind in, uh, in the Midwest. Uh, I mean, some of your North Dakota projects, for example, are certainly probably up around 50%, you know, some of these areas with, with modern wind turbines today. And that number has increased over the last 10 years as equipment gets better. And that's brought the cost of energy from wind down. So before we even build a wind project, I mean, we have looked at everything we can. We, we look at, okay, what directions is the energy going to be coming from? That changes how we lay out the turbines, how we optimize that layout. You know, we've got all the different terrain. We've got uh, the diurnal patterns, the monthly patterns, the annual patterns. And the distribution at the top there matters, too, because two, two wind projects can have exactly the same average annual wind speed. But if the distribution of those wind speeds is different, it'll have different power output because a lot of that is sitting right in that steep part of the power curve, a nonlinear relationship going from wind speed to power with that cubic relationship. So the distribution of the winds matters just as much as the average does. Okay? So it's a, it's a tricky problem to try to figure this out just from a few measurements and some models, but uh, we're doing much better than in, in past years. The other thing is, okay, once you're built and operating, uh, you know, you'd love everything to be right on that nice clean power curve line, the black line there. But of course, some of the time you're curtailed, like this horizontal blue area here. You know, if you were curtailed by transmission capacity, you had more wind, but you couldn't use it. You were only allowed to produce that amount of power. Or there's, there's operating problems or curtailment, like down at the bottom here, where you just were not running at all, or you were down for, for maintenance. And uh, we now do a lot more with this, because the fleets are getting to the size where people are spending a lot more time looking at operational efficiency and performance, right? So today, you know, a lot of our work now that we're, we're delivering for, uh, for our next year energy in particular and others, we're analyzing all the SCADA data, everything we get from every turbine. You know, every 10 minutes, we get, we get data from these turbines, the entire fleet. And we look at all of that and produce reports every day now that roll us up and allow people to dive in down to individual turbines and say, was it producing what it should have produced based on the available wind resource? If not, Okay, why, why was that dot below the power curve? Why was that a sub, sub curve performance there? Is it something we can fix? Is it something we're doing wrong? Is it the OEM's problem? There's something wrong in the control system? You know, or was it you know, how we're being dispatched into the market or something? You know, why were we not up at the perfect line? And we're trying to really do a lot more of this to, to squeeze more out of the operating fleet. Because once you, you know, once you got, uh, you know, 10 or $20 billion uh, invested in this stuff, you actually want to get some money, some power out of it, and get the most you can on your investment. So this might be a good time to take a break, huh? And uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we do, how long do you want? You want 10 minutes or just five minutes or 10? Why don't we get back going at, at five minutes to uh, 10 then, okay?